Welcome to Candid Conversation number 202. 202. We are going to cover today 21 clues that you're going to the wrong church. These are just things that if I was going to go to church for the first time and I saw these things in the church, it would give me a clue that I'm in the wrong church. Uh, God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And so while, I mean, you know, any church you go to, you may see a few of these things and it wouldn't be a big deal, but it's just, uh, the more of these things you see, the more it's a clue that they are going by their flesh and they're after money instead of sound doctrine. And so these are some things you can look for if you go to a new church and you see them, you probably don't want to be attending there. Number one, the Bibles. Are the people in the church, I'm talking about the people who attend, do they bring their own Bible? If people don't bring their Bibles, then the Bible probably is not their final authority in that church. Number two, lyrics of the songs. If the lyrics include a lot of I or me focus, they don't really talk about God, they don't talk about Jesus, chances are it's a watered down church. They're not going to have sound doctrine there. Number three, Bible versions. What version do they use? They use the King James, you know, they're using God's Word preserved today in the English language. They're using NIV. There's not going to be much truth there because they've taken it away in the new versions. And then, of course, there are other versions as well. Uh, number four, the time spent in Scripture. When the pastor is up there preaching, is he giving you a lot of Scripture? Is he just telling you stories? Is he telling you just philosophies? Or even if he is talking about God and salvation or whatever that's a good biblical topic, how does he give it to you? Is he just telling you what churchianity says? Or is he actually giving you sound doctrine? Is he giving you saying, this is the scripture. We believe this, we teach this because the scripture says it and here's the proof, here's the scripture. Time spent in scripture. Number five, how many people are in the church? Uh, again, that doesn't mean, you know, if you've got, a lot of times people think, well, it's a big church, so that's good. No, it's not. Churches are a lot like any, uh, you know, like a business. A lot of times the reason you have a big store like a Walmart or something, the reason you have a big store with a lot of people in it is because people know about that and there's a lot of talk, there's, they do a lot of advertising and then even if they don't, a word of mouth tells you, oh, that's a good church, you need to come to that church. If you're preaching the truth, people and word of mouth isn't going to spread this what's what's going to say is don't go to that church because we're in that time in second timothy 4 where men will not endure sound doctrine but will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will turn their their ears away from the truth and will be turned unto fables that's the time that we're in and so if there's a church with you know a couple thousand people i mean right away that's a clue that the truth isn't spoken there. If the truth is spoken there, there aren't going to be as many people. Now, the church I grew up in, we had maybe 30 people, but the truth still wasn't spoken there. So again, that doesn't mean if they're a whole, if it's a small church that it's sound doctrine. It's just that's a clue because um, if sound doctrine, if the truth is being taught at a church, chances are not many people are going to be there. Okay, number six. The music length. How much time do they spend with the music? Again, nothing wrong with music. Nothing wrong with singing songs that have sound doctrine in them. They're a way of worshiping the Lord. The main way of worshiping the Lord is in spirit and in truth. So it's mainly by getting sound doctrine in your inner man. But uh, singing to yourself psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's a scripture in Colossians. That uh, singing is a good thing uh, with 
as long as it's got good words to it. But the question is, do they spend an hour singing and five minutes with the sermon? Do they spend, sing 10 songs and the sermon's only 20 minutes? If they're doing that, probably not where you want to go. It's more focused on emotion, probably, than it is on sound doctrine. Okay, number seven. Other flesh appeal is what I called it. Uh, things like having coffee, having childcare, having a breastfeeding room, um, having things that appeal to the flesh. And again, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having a coffee, popping some coffee out there for the people that come. Nothing wrong with providing care for the children so you, the adults can uh, get edified in the doctrine. Nothing wrong with it. But my point is, if that's the big appeal, then that's not a good thing. There was a church in Atlanta that grew up as a mega church overnight, became one of the top 10 churches in the United States in attendance pretty much overnight. And a large part of it had to do with with the child care. I mean, it was, you look at it, you know, finding a babysitter for something is not easy. And if you do find one and the babysitter is reliable, well, then you got to pay them. Church, though, they provide free child care. There are people who go to churches just because of the free child care. Did a candid conversation not too long ago. Vulgar babysitting, I called it. VBS instead of Vacation Bible School. Where there are people, Lana worked with someone who actually, in the summer, rather than having to pay for child care while her kid is in out of school, she would find a cop from one VBS to another and get free child care. People do that on Sundays. I mean, sure, they'd rather go to a movie or have a night out, but you know, if it's free child care, they don't mind it, so they'll sit through a sermon or sit through a service. So, uh, I get nothing wrong with offering nursery care or having children's church, but I'm just saying that if that's the main focus or that's the main draw, you go to the church's website and they're talking about their, their nursery program and that may be a clue that they're not teaching sound doctrine. Number eight, how many services does the church have? Do they only have a Sunday morning service? If that's all they have, it may be a clue they're not teaching sound doctrine. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean it because if you're teaching sound doctrine, uh, chances are you're not going to have that many people. So the pastor may be willing to have a Wednesday night service and a Sunday night service and a Sunday morning service, and he's tried it, and they only get like three people to show up for those services. So because people aren't interested, they just have a Sunday morning service. So that, you know, that makes sense. I mean, that's what, when I was pastor of the church, um, we only had Sunday morning. I did it for two hours, but uh, we only had it Sunday morning. I didn't have night services. Number one, I lived over an hour away, and I worked full time, so it was hard to do it um, at night. But number two, there just wasn't an interest. We'd have five to ten people show up for a service on Sunday morning. If I had it at Sunday night, it might just be me and my wife, and maybe one or two others at, at the most. So uh, again, having more services means is more likely to say they're sound doctrine, but if it's just a small church, just having a Sunday morning may be all you have. But th that's just one clue there. So that was number eight. Number nine, smooth talking. And this isn't just for the pastor, this is the, the worship leader as well. If they're polished, you know, they have a good sounding speaking voice, or they, they don't use um or uh, or they use, good sounding words and they just sound like they're real polished professional speakers. I get nothing wrong with that. It's good that you have a, a clear voice and people can understand what you're saying. Uh, that you know that's you don't want somebody has it was hard to understand what they're saying because that way the truth gets through better with a clear voice. But uh, if they sound like a professional speaker that gives you a clue that maybe they were trained in that. And the focus isn't sound doctrine, but it's on a fair show in the flesh. So that would be another clue as to maybe that's not a church that you should be attending. Uh, number 10, looking like the world. And when I say looking like the world, I'm thinking of, 
you look at the people, you know, a lot of times you can tell what a church is like before the service actually starts. If you just get there early and look around, you can see I mean, if the women, especially you look at the women, if the women are half naked, wearing a lot of makeup and jewelry, if, the, if it looks like they're trying to emulate Hollywood in their style and how they dress and how they look, uh, right there, that's a clue there of the world. God says, uh, Paul told Timothy to, that the women should adorn themselves with modest apparel, not putting gold in their hair, braiding the hair, and having that outward adornment. But the outward adornment, according to Peter, is the, the meek and quiet spirit of the woman. If you see women there who are looking like the world, looking like prostitutes, or at least looking like people who would flirt at a bar, wearing what they're wearing or not wearing, as the case may be, uh, that's a big clue that, that if the people are like that, then that means the church probably appeals to the flesh. And so it's not a church you should be going to, probably. Uh, same thing with the, the pastor and the people that get up front. Yeah, wow. What about the women? Are they half naked up there? What about the men? Are they wearing expensive clothing, name brand clothes? That, you know, a suit that would cost $1,000? Again, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with wearing, looking nice and present, having a good pre presentation to get people to come. But it's just, if, that, if that's what they're wearing, chances are that's their focus. And it's not on the sound doctrine. I know where I taught two years in the church, um, I didn't wear a suit. I didn't even wear a tie. I mean, I wore nice, a nice shirt. And, uh, but I just wore like I'd normally wear going out on Saturday. Sneakers, khaki pants, polo shirt. Uh, you know, because the emphasis wasn't on outward appearance, it was on sound doctrine. Uh, let's see, number 11. What about, uh, do the people look in the parking lot when you, when you come in? Do they have expensive cars in the parking lot? What kind of house does the pastor have, if you know? you know, Does he have a, a big mansion? The, there's the tax-exempt status now where churches are allowed to have a parsonage and have it tax-free. You don't have to pay taxes. So if you have a big church with a lot of money, a lot of times the pastor's got a multi-million dollar home. If that's what he's got and he's driving a big fancy car and the people that go to that church have fancy cars, that's another clue that sound doctrine isn't being taught there. Again, nothing wrong with it. It's okay to have money in this world. But, uh, and it's good to have, if you've got a church that has sound doctrine, a lot of times they're struggling financially. And so if you have people that have money and they're giving, you know, that really helps out. But um, chances are, though, if the pastor's got a multi-million dollar home, drives a fancy car, and a lot of other people in the church have fancy cars, probably sound doctrine is not taught there. We went one time in Birmingham to a church just for a concert at night and we saw all the people that were dressed up with fancy clothes, name brand clothes, fancy cars in the parking lot. We knew right away sound doctrine was not being taught at that church. Um, okay, that was number 11. Number 12. Uh, I've got something on here. Pastors title yeah the title that's it is the pastor called the reverend da 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 the apostle the high one or uh, the priest or even if they call him pastor pastor so and so hey, again nothing wrong with using a title when i was pastor i told him just call me eric i i do not want a title uh, in the book of psalms it says that god's name it says reverend is his name reverend should never be used by a pastor of a church that's god's name a pastor is not revered you can respect him for his knowledge in the word but you shouldn't revere him you should not worship the pastor church i grew up in a lot of pastor appreciations love offerings for the pastor Everything was about the pastor. He was the man of God. We didn't question him, one person said in the church. When you hear stuff like that, 
giving glory to the pastor, elevating him above what a man should be elevated, that's a clue that you're in a church that does not teach sound doctrine. Okay, that was number 11. All right, I'm sorry, that was number 12. Number 13. Emphasis on money, and that's a big one. If every service they're talking about giving, that's a clue that it's not sound doctrine. Giving today, what, and what do they say? Do they require a tithe? They require a tithe. That's not what God's doing today. God is, um, you are to give as you purpose in your heart today. It's not a mandatory 10% and then offerings on top of that. And so if they're requiring a tithe or if they keep hounding people about money all the time. The occasional sermon on giving is fine so that people know what giving should be. Uh, probably my most popular sermon on YouTube, I've got almost 5,000 hits, is about proper giving. And I did that in the church because I wanted them to know tithing is not for today. But if people are preaching tithing, grace churches do that. I know of a grace church that said that uh, under the law, you are supposed to give 10%, but grace is bigger than the law, so you need to be giving more than 10%. That is not sound doctrine. Give as you purpose in your heart. And so that should not be a church that you should be going to. Uh, number 14, we talked about this before, storytelling. Does the pastor just tell a bunch of stories that sound good? Nothing wrong with telling a story to illustrate a point, but if that's all he's doing, then he's feeding the flesh, making you feel good through his much speaking and his storytelling rather than giving you sound doctrine. The sound doctrine for today is found in Paul's epistles, and there aren't many stories in Paul's epistles. It's just hard-hitting sound doctrine one right after the other. You don't have parables. You don't have history. It's here's the sound doctrine. And so I realize that can be boring. It does not appeal to the flesh, but that's what's needed for the inner man. And so if you have a church where the pastor is just telling nice stories, it's probably not a church you should be attending. Uh, number 15, uh, things that you see. Do they have a baptismal pool? Well, water baptism is not for today. Now, maybe the church, you know, maybe they teach sound doctrine, but they... Uh, bought the church and it already had a baptismal pool in it because the church before them about water baptized it'd be expensive to take it out you know uh, you know it could there could be reasons for there being one but if you see a baptismal pool especially if you see a communion table or like the menorah up front with an altar there or uh, if you see statues of saints um, just or candles that are lit all around, uh, you know, having this sort of the mythical, not, nothing wrong with lighting a candle, you don't go to hell for lighting a candle, but, uh, you know, if you've got those things, it seems more like a Catholic, a traditional type thing. I went to a church one time, I was hunting for churches, and I didn't know anything about it, I just saw this, it was called Brand New Life Church, and I went there, and it was just the weirdest thing, it's like they mixed all this other stuff, and they were giving me a tour of the church, and here's this Here's this place where you can bow down to Mary and you've got these candles and you can pray and worship there. And this was supposedly a non-denominational church, but yet they've got these Catholic idols there. Idols, candles. I mean, this was years ago. Um, and again, like I say, I had nothing, knew nothing about it and uh, never went back, but it made for a funny story. Uh, but you see things like that. If you see a communion table, water baptismal, um, altar with menorahs and candles and idols and statues those are things you know stained glass windows um, things that are fleshly representations to make the flesh feel good like this is a house of worship when you see things like that chances are sound doctrine is not being taught there again maybe you're renting the, the right division church is renting a building or maybe they bought it cheap and the, because the church was out and you can't don't have the money to replace the same stained glass windows that's fine but i'm just saying this is a, just another clue that you're going to a church that doesn't teach sound doctrine a uh, number 16 is 
Does the church have tables? When you go in, do they have tables? You sit down in a chair, you put your Bible on the table, you have room to uh, take out a piece of paper, write notes. Um, and I should add to that as well. Do they have King James Version Bibles in the back for people who didn't bring a Bible that they can use? Uh, do they have scratch pieces of paper and pen for people who forgot those at home where they can uh, take notes? In other words, is the Bible the focus? Is this going to be a study or is this going to be a place where I feel good? If it's going to be a study, it should be a lot like a classroom with tables. The church I was at, um, the pastor, we didn't have tables. That's just because it would have required more room. It would have required a bigger building. It would have required more money. Uh, so, I mean, again, this isn't a deal breaker, but I'm saying if you go into a church and all they've got are tables and chairs and everybody who's there can sit at a, sit at a table and have take notes, that's a very good indication you've got some sound doctrine there because not many churches set up that way. Okay, uh, okay that was number 16. Number 17. What do they do with holidays? And again, if you're just attending one time, you may not. <laughs> this is something you can't know. But do they have a special Easter service, a sunrise service? In Ezekiel 8, we find in the temple of the Lord, God is going through the temple with Ezekiel, showing him these abominations that they're doing. And he says, I'm going to show you greater abominations. And the greatest abomination is at the end where you have 25 men, I believe it's 25 men, facing toward the east, bowing down and worshiping the sun. An Easter service, sunrise service, is just, it's pagan, it's worshiping the sun. Uh, Baal is the sun god. Baal worship is the primary part of Satan's um, you know the God that Satan has in his religion so if they have a sunrise I realize they're probably not bowing down to the Sun but if you have a sunrise service it's a religious thing Christmas are they you go Christmas time do they have 18 Christmas trees around there with decorations and nothing wrong with that it's just not sending the right message it's a pagan worship those Christmas trees so um, that's a clue you're in the wrong church number 18 how the women dress we already talked about that um, are they wearing mini skirts? Probably not the right church to go to. Number 19, and this is a big one. Who's in charge of the church? Paul says, I do not, uh, I do not suffer a woman to usurp authority over a man. Paul says, let the woman be in subjection to the man. Let the woman be silent in the church. He says that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is the man. If women are in control of the church, and a lot of churches today, women are in control, even if they're not the ones standing up there, behind the scenes, they're in control of the church. If the women are controlling the church, they are not following God's structure. And this isn't a sexist thing, it's God has given different roles to women as he did to men. And if the women are not taking their proper role of being subject to men in the church, that's a clue you're in the wrong church. Woman pastor, right away, you know, don't go to that church. Number 20, is sound doctrine the primary emphasis? What, what are they talking about? Are they getting into the Word, getting the Bible out and spending most of the time with that? Or in their announcements, are they talking about, oh, we're doing a lot of mission work. We're doing a lot of, we're building a new fellowship hall. We're doing this, we're doing that. Look at all the great things we're doing. Instead of, we're starting a Bible study. We are getting the word out to those uh, people. You know, where, what are they talking about? Is sound doctrine the primary emphasis? And then number 21, the 21 clue, number 21 clue that you're in the wrong church, and this is a good summary, is, is a clear gospel taught. 
Paul says in Galatians 1, If anyone preach any other gospel than what I have given to you, let him be accursed. I say again, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So are they teaching Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins? And is that a clear message? Is it something that they hide that you have to ask about? Well, how do I get to heaven? Is it something that you, oh, well, you got to talk to the pastor afterward. You got to go to this prayer room. Or is it every service when they've got people new there? That's what I did. If I saw somebody new in there uh, in a service, I didn't know if they were saved or not. I made sure sometime in that message I gave the gospel. Trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for your sins to have eternal life. I fit it in there somehow. Um, is that being done or is the gospel hidden? They don't talk about it. They can use the word gospel, but are they actually saying the gospel? Recognize you're a sinner. Trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. If they're not, that's a clue you're in the wrong church. There you go. Thanks for watching.